Hello everybody, so this lecture is looking at food web modularity, also some kind of mis miscellaneous stuff about food webs. So um, this idea of modularity is also called compartmentation, and it's basically looking at um, how, like, are there different pathways within the, the food web, or are there different, like, groups of species? So the formal um, uh, uh, definition looks at is right here, right? The degree of isolated subwebs with few connections between the subwebs. So with these, um, with this food web over here, you know, the species on the left are really only um, interacting with the species on the right in, you know, through mediation of the top predator and this one, um, this one link where, okay, let's just call this species A and species B. Okay, so um, what happens is compartmentation or modularity um, really increases, has the ability to increase food web stability. So imagine we have species C over here and species D over here, right? Now, if there's a big fluctuation, if something happens to um, species C here, is it going to affect you know, species D? And the answer is probably not, right? Um, it could in, in the sense of, you know, if it filters up through here to species B, spil filters up, and then that uh, there might be some like apparent competition between species B and species uh, D. But, you know, you know it, it, it's a bit, quite a long path to get from species D, C, to over to species D. And so the fluctuations of a species in one um, module of the food web is going to not propagate to the entire web as easily because it is more isolated. And that should increase the stability. And what we've seen is through you know modeling and through um, empirical observations, we do see that it uh, increased modularity, increased compartmentation does increase stability. Uh, so where is this actually you know shown up? Uh, what we can see is there's um, oftentimes two compartments within a food web that we call the green portion of the food web and the brown portion of the food web. Sometimes this is called the fast and the slow cycles. But um, what it is, is um, the, the riverine productivity model really looks at this idea in large rivers, looks at the green and the brown food web in these large, large rivers. Um, and the green module is really looking at how where you start with algae right that's what is right here okay and algae most of it really gets eaten by herbivores right this is why um, if we go back to that idea of um, the why is the world green that Hairston, Slobodkin and Smith paper where we see that you know there isn't a lot of algae standing biomass in um, aquatic system. So most of it actually goes this way and we can see here that we have a thicker arrow. Let's make that even more more thick, right? Um, and most of that energy is flowing up to the herbivores which then feeds this whole um, you know into the zooplankton, into the um, carnivores and the insectivorous fish and piscivorous fish. So um, where we kind of have, you know, paraphyton, macroinverts, and fish in the metazoans, the bigger stuff that we can see. However, most lake, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say lakes, um, even though this does a little bit apply to lakes, but most rivers also have a huge input of alloxanous carbon. So this is basically detritus. So dead plants from terrestrial sources. Um, and we can see here in this picture, it's actually a bigger box, right? There is more alloxanus, there's more detritus going into a stream than there is actually algae. Um, you know, especially during fall when we have leaves falling into a, a stream system. And, um, but, but this energy kind of stays within a, a, a simple module of a microbial and viral loop where um, a lot of this is, a lot of that, um, that detritus stuff goes up into the bacteria 
um, and those bacteria then are um, processing that material, eating that material, um, getting eaten, not necessarily eaten, but getting lysed by viruses and that energy that was in that detritus kind of stays within this microbial loop and the energy that goes into algae um, kind of stays all over here. Now certainly some of that algae does die and get eaten by microbes, but there's two kind of separate food webs within the, the grander food web. And that's where we're talking about that uh, modularity. And we can see this um, commonly in, in the, the, the idea of a green and a brown food web in lots of different ecosystems. All right, switching gears then. Um, I think food webs are a really good way to show the idea of indirect effects, okay? Um, how one species can affect another species through uh, a mediator species, right? And so these are these ideas like exploitative competition, right? So if you have two, uh, two species um, eating a resource species, that um, they're never really going to be directly interacting, right? Um, if you have, in the case of, you know, seals, um, seals eating a fish species, but uh, there's another predatory fish, the seals and that predatory fish don't necessarily interact, um, but they're, they're in some ways indirectly interacting through that shared prey species. And then we've, you know, we've talked about apparent competition as these, um, the, and trophic cascades and keystone predation as these type of indirect effects. Um, and food webs make it easy to see how these pathways exist. The pathways are generally longer. They take longer than direct interactions, right? So, you know, predation is a super direct interaction that can have drastic impacts very quickly. Um, indirect effects are oftentimes weaker and take longer um, than direct effects. So food webs are uh, difficult to study for a variety of reasons. Um, determining the leaks can be um, super, super hard to do. Basically, there's um, seasonal differences. Think about, you know, what a white-tailed deer is eating in um, spring, a lot of nice uh, plants, newly sprouted plants, and then as you get through the season, right, they'll start to eat corn, they'll start to eat acorns, and then they'll start to eat barks off of trees in late winter. So, um, you know, you, building a food web, a real community food web, is hard to do. Um, there's also ontogenetic diet shifts. What that means is how does the diet change through the lifespan of an organism? So largemouth bass are this great example of where they start off as macroinvertebrate eaters. Um, you know, while largemouth bass do have very big mouths, um, they can't start eating smaller fish until they get, you know, quite a bit bigger than those fish. Um, and, you know, so they start out eating bugs and then, you know, within maybe by the end, a couple months old, by the end of the summer that they were born in, they'll be able to be eat, starting to eat smaller fish. So building a food web can be very difficult in that sense. Um, and also then we got to think about population dynamics, okay? If we're trying to model a food web where we have um, burr oak trees in the food web, you know, we need to really get a sense of how does the population dynamics of this long-lived oak tree that lives 300 years change through hundreds of generations. Well, what is hundred generation, hundreds of generations of oak trees? That's, you know, potentially, uh, you know, 3,000 years or something, right? So you can have, you know, a, a, a long-lived species making these um, uh, food web studies really hard to do in if you're looking at a real ecosystem. So real, realistically, what um, scientists do when they're looking at food web stuff is really look at small organisms, small ecosystems that have short generation times and very simple communities. So some of the uh, biggest, um, uh, most well-studied like food web research is looking at bromeliads. Bromeliads are these um, plants that 
live in tropical places and they collect water in their flowers basically and you can have whole aquatic communities in here of slugs and um, algae and uh, mosquito larvae and then predatory things uh, spiders and frogs and all sorts of different species that live in here but it's still you know we're really talking about maybe two or three trophic levels and you know ten species maybe total interacting in this in the system so uh, food webs are kind of food web studies for certain are uh, overrepresented by um, small organisms and quickly generating species all right with that See you later. We'll pick back up on looking at stable isotopes. <laughs>